Um, the, the next panel, I think, picks up um, very nicely on sort of the landscape that we're discussing, which is um, a problem that um, we've seen at AppBacker very closely, that developers face incredible challenges um, when it comes to distributing and marketing apps. Um, there is this extraordinary fragmentation. And I think partly because we've Many of us have been so focused on the Apple market um, that we thought, well, it's always going to be just like this, that every app is going to sell um, basically at the same price of 70% you know, of the, the retail value. That's what the developer is effectively selling his app at. And regardless of where it is on the growth curve, that's what's going to happen. There's going to be one launch, and it's going to be worldwide, and it's available everywhere. So that's it. And um, I think Vishal did a great job at, at discussing what really some of the A players um, do in the market, which is a lot more sophisticated. It's a lot more like um, the movie industry, where you look at testing in certain markets. You really tweak it to get it just right. Um, you have a planned and systematic rollout. You're really trying to maximize distribution. Um, this challenge is really significant. The opportunity is probably even bigger um, now with the advent of, or the beyond the advent, the tremendous growth um, of, uh, of Android. So we want to spend a little bit of time talking about um, how do you distribute and market apps? What's the best approaches? Um, what are some of the innovative ideas? Where does the road lie ahead? And we're very lucky to have a, a really terrific panel who's going to talk about this um, from a number of different perspectives. And um, we're especially grateful um, to have uh, Carolyn um, Luco, who's here, to, from the Wireless Industry Partnership, um, to moderate that panel. And I'll let her um, introduce the panelists and uh, start us off. So uh, on our panel, I've got Charles Yim, America's Mobile Application Partnership with Google. And you must be Steve. Yes. OK. Steve, sure. Nice to meet you, too. Glad you can join us. And uh, Steve is uh, with Opera, and you were with App 3D. Uh, Ad Marvel. Ad Marvel, sorry, that got sold. To Opera back oh. in January 2010. Okay, a while ago. And uh, Claudia, come and join us. Claudia Romani Bacchus, who is with Barnes & Noble, who uh, I often find when I talk about app stores, um, the Barnes & Noble, uh, the Nook app store, is something that developers don't really think about. And I think it's got some really uh, different statistics than some of the ones that we typically hear. <laughs> and uh, Sheffield, yes. so if you want to take that yes. one, nice nice you too. Yeah. <laughs> so this, is a, this, is, this topic is about Android app stores, and actually one of the things that our company does, um, we were started back, uh, WIP was started back in 2006, recognizing early on that developers were the hot stuff in this ecosystem and really weren't being recognized properly, and that was something that we wanted to do. And uh, you know how how could we best connect them to folks like you, uh, folks like now there are app stores before it was more more uh, carrier and operator decks. And uh, one of the things we do now is track application stores, and uh, we're pretty excited. You know we've got about 125 application stores we track on a regular basis. And then when I looked at this and it said 160 Android stores, like who knew? Um, so it's uh, I think in this industry. <coughs> Whether it's you know stats like this that are really hard to keep up with, or um, you know unless any of you have been sleeping over the last two weeks, never a dull moment in this industry. <laughs> so uh, good to get some experts in here, and hopefully we can have some interactive activity with the audience too. So um, what I want to do is just go through each of you very briefly because I'm not sure everybody knows sort of maybe even what what you do specifically, just to introduce yourselves, let us know exactly what you're responsible for, and some tidbit about your industry that probably we don't know yet, and uh, or some, you know, some new announcements. So Charles, why don't we start off with you? Sure. I think I know a lot of folks here today, but not all of you. Uh, my name is Charles Yun. I lead our mobile games and smartphone application partnerships for the mobile advertising business uh, at Google in the Americas, so in the Western Hemisphere. Um, I joined Google as part of its acquisition of AdMob, which is a mobile advertising network. Uh, the acquisition closed 
May 28th of last year. Um, I'm trying to think of what would be interesting. Uh, you know, this is a particular salient topic, I think, because um, for those of you who are not familiar with AdMob, it was a venture backed startup, it's a mobile ad network, and uh, its founder, Omar Kamoy, actually came up with the idea because uh, he had tried to start a mobile social network for future phones, so predating the iPhone kind of back in 2006, and he found that there was no good way for him to get traffic or, you know, to get distribution. And so, you know, this is a problem that has predated the smartphone. It has been a problem for content developers in mobile for many years now. And actually, AdMob, um, you know, the genesis of AdMob was solving that problem of acquiring distribution. And Steve, yes. you can get everybody straight here. <laughs> so, Steve Manning, I, uh, I manage Opera Mobile Storefront, which launched just uh, two quarters ago. Before that, I uh, was the founder of Ad Marvel, which is a mediation and optimization ad business. So uh, we were acquired by Opera in January of 2010. We work a lot with Mobflex, actually. We provide uh, similar functions. Um, our user base tends our, our publisher base, people like Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, uh, AOL, Pandora, a lot of premium uh, media brands. And uh, monetization for publishers is something that we've had to deal with a lot we care a lot about, and so when Opera decided to launch a mobile storefront, I moved over there because uh, I have a lot of experience with how publishers can actually monetize these things they build. Uh, prior to uh, at Marvel, I was actually at VeriSign, I was on the team that looked at the acquisition of Jamba, which, if you're familiar, back in, in the early 2000s, Jamba was probably the first billion dollar mobile content business. It was ringtones and, and wallpapers and Java apps. That whole selling uh, on carrier decks or selling directly through TV ads. Uh, Jumbo really pioneered the whole uh, TV advertisements of ringtones. And that business is essentially atrophy. It's, it's completely moved now to an app store centric world. It's, it's been very interesting to see that happen. Uh, I would also say, as far as an interesting point, Opera has 200 million users worldwide. Uh, of, of its uh, browser, and a lot of that is in the feature phones that Vishal talked about earlier. We have a huge presence in, in countries like Asia and Eastern Europe as well as, as Western Europe with a lot of deployments through carriers. So we look at a lot of the, the challenge of um, how carriers are going to create storefronts, how they're going to be able to monetize their subscriber base, opening up billing systems so that you have more than just the, the iTunes storefront and, and Google checkout as, as ways to make money. And Claudia, tell us a little bit about the um, book. Um, yes, I'm Claudia Romanini. I apologize, I've been sick, so it sounds a little weird. <laughs> but I really wanted to be here today. Um, I'm responsible for the Nook Developer, which is our developer relations program at Barnes & Noble, and Nook Apps, which is our third-party applications program. I've been with Barnes & Noble for a year, which is as long as the program has existed. I actually built and launched the team to create this program. Um, most people don't know that our products have been built on Android since the very beginning. The original Nook was an Android product, and the Nook Color, this one here that if you want to see later I can show you, um, is a tablet built on Android as well. Um, Nook Color launched in October of last year, and uh, that's when we launched the program and we announced that we were going to support third-party apps and actually open it up to the to developers. <coughs> Um, what's unique about Nook Color is that although it's built on Android, it actually has a unique interface that's uh, really driven to uh, an optimized reading experience. So it's really all about reading. Like we call it the reader's tablet. Um, and what's unique about us and what we're doing with developers is we're targeting a completely different demographic than what we talked about earlier this morning. So contrary to the stats that we saw this morning for mobile, our stats are basically 75% are women, our demographics, so, um, and they're actually older women. They're between the ages of 25 and 45. They're mothers, um, working women. And, yummy, um, yummy mummies. And they're buying content for their kids. Um, and so this makes us very unique. Um, another interesting fact is that most of them have feature phones, not smartphones. Um, and they're buying apps on their color for the first time. I mean, basically, they're using apps, sorry, for, um, for the first time on their color. So they may never have had an opportunity to use an app before because they're not typically owners of tablets, iPads, or smartphones. Um, and which is also why, in our model, um, over 90% of apps right now are paid. Um, and that may seem to be contrary to the trends in the market today, and we certainly are very aware of the trends. Um, but um, our customers are used to buying content. 
Um, that's why they buy a reader's tablet, because they buy books and magazines, and therefore they buy apps. Um, and our top selling or top grossing apps have grossed over $100,000 in revenue in the first 30 days of sale. So we're extremely successful. We're a developer community right now. They're pretty thrilled to be working with us. Um, I should also say that pretty much every app that's running through our store sells from day one. Um, there isn't an app that isn't getting discovered and, and bought by a customer. Um, so it's a very interesting business model. Maybe we all want to go up right now and develop apps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Look at what you're doing. <laughs> Thanks, Claudia. Sheffield. Yes, my name is Sheffield Nolan. I'm the CEO of App Redeem. We started in January. Uh, we're all about uh, real rewards for real users, real engagement. We uh, are completely focused on driving engagement to app developers for their apps in both Android and in iOS, um, discoverability and uh, follow-on engagement. So what, what, is, what do you do exactly? We have... Or what do you offer, I guess? Right, so what we have is we have uh, members which would come to our site and then uh, are reminded to engage or to try an app if they haven't tried it yet in Android or in iOS, which then uh, creates more users for that app and then we can also retarget as well. Our network is growing uh, incredibly quickly right now. So, so we're... we a cross promotion on... Cross promotion, but everything's focused totally on apps. So we're not about pushing brands through apps or pushing things that aren't about mobile. We are using mobile devices to push um, other mobile apps through those mobile devices. So we're totally focused on the app developer, not on brands. Okay. Um, Charles, I wanted to ask you about these 160 Android. Is that is that a correct number? There's 160 Android stores and uh, curated Android yeah. stores. What What's the definition of a, what, what does that really look like? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. I, I could definitively tell you how many apps there are. I'm sure there are Who probably came up dozens with the 160 more numbers? as we speak. Mm -hmm. yeah, some smart guy. Yeah. Is the number outside of the US or are we talking about? Because I know that there is at least like 60, 50 in China. Is in, yeah. is of in, Android stores. Yes. I mean, I, I think even kind of the lack of clarity is really just indicative of um, how dynamic the market is. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, I would not be surprised if there are a dozen gay forum that would be seen right now. And so, so they tend to be independents as opposed to connected to carrier operator. Correct. Um, you know, but there's more of those that are being... I think the oh, important thing about thinking about um, the proliferation of app stores is not the absolute number, but the function that they serve. So digital, um, from our perspective, and <laughs> mobile in particular, is a winner take winner winner take winner takes most, if not winner takes all business. So clearly, you know, on iPhone, it's in a closed ecosystem. There's the Apple iTunes App Store, and then. Um, you know, on Android, the Android market is still the primary kind of venue to discover apps, but um, as a more open ecosystem, then you have the formation of all sorts of new app stores. There's some well-known third-party ones like GetJar, Amazon is clearly creating its own. And, um, you know, the reason why that creates any value, I think, is that, uh, you know, or why there's a value proposition to be had in, in trying to build new app stores is that even though winner takes most, I think, um, in the digital realm, if you, as a content publisher, clearly there are very rare, rare instances when a single title like an Angry Birds will get so much global adoption and it kind of t tends to take most. But that's not to say that there aren't natural audiences for every piece sure. of content, you know, niche content, niche audiences. And I think, um, you know, effective curation and, and the ability to build a good app store and understand who or being able to get the right content in front of the right users is really a question as to whether you know an app store is worthy of existing or not. Mm -hmm. Actually, so Claudia, I mean, I would consider what you have is a pre very premium Android app store, where I think a lot of the 50 ones that are probably in China are, you know, somebody setting up. The, yeah. I mean, so there's a lot of entrepreneurs in China that will always do something. Do you see like how many others? How many other premium stores are there out there like what you have? Um, I think we're fairly unique. I, I mean, there's others, but. Um, one thing I should have noted is we actually don't have our own app store. We, we are completely integrated in our storefront. So customers are used to buying from Barnes & Noble. We have 1,300 retail stores. So most customers know us through our retail stores. They walk into the store and they can purchase anything. <coughs> 
Um, and we treat apps in exactly the same way in terms of approaching apps, putting them on the quote unquote shelf in our bookstore, um, whether it's online or on the device. Um, so we never really designed our approach to be an app store. Uh, when I came in, I had to really understand, I don't come from the publishing world, I come from the mobile world, and I had to really understand how the publishing world works and how books are sold and magazines, because that model clearly worked for Barnes & Noble, because uh, our customers are uh, used to buying digital content from us, and so we just basically introduced apps in the exact same way. So when you're browsing in our storefront, you can browse from books and magazines and apps, and we cross-merchandise all the time. So if someone's browsing for a cookbook, we can merchandise the Epicurious app, for example. And so we really are focused on targeting our customer and we know what they're looking for and we know what they're buying and we're offering them apps in that sort of in that, you know, within that experience, which is why I think we are successful. Uh, Does anybody curious. else um, know of any sort of really high end sort of premium app stores that are around like that? I'm sure we'll see more of them, but. Uh, well, in the enterprise side of the business, you have, yeah, you know, it's a it's different model, true. but it's basically a premium yeah. that paid model, you know, so. Sure. Yeah. 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 More specific. Right, it, it, just to, to add to that, it's, it's interesting to see how uh, in the future, today, mobile distribution is through the app stores. In the past, it was through the carrier decks. Browsers are becoming much more powerful. And are we going to see the rise of distribution through browsers as opposed to through application storefronts and, and already you see what do some, you think well obviously I don't <laughs> but I mean we're, we're agnostic so so we, we really just look at getting content to users as being the most important thing uh, the the fundamental role of, of a storefront really needs to be two things one is distribution so how do you enable discoverability in, in a very large kind of confusing marketplace and then two is monetization how do you enable developers to make money whether that's either supporting uh, some sort of a payment tool which could be a carrier billing system could be a credit card could be paypal could be you know, one of the the, uh, the the apis to the storefronts like um, google and, and itunes and um, and add monetization and so i think as as people like amazon move in they're going to define a different kind of storefront. Everyone's wondering what Facebook is gonna do, because Facebook is definitely gonna be interested in a browser-based solution as opposed to kind of necessarily a more of a client-side approach. And I think in the next 12 months, you're gonna see a real shift in what distribution means for content. It may look more web-like, where anyone can set up their, their, uh, their service, they can market it over the web by buying banner ads, and they don't necessarily have to go through the storefront. Because storefronts, to, a storefront like Apple today still takes a pretty significant tax for, for what it provides. And, and Google has come out and said, look, we're not gonna do the 5% on, our, on payments as opposed to 30%. Um, Apple can still afford to be where it is because it is the, it is the one that connects the payment tool to the application. And so monetization is better on, on iOS than it is on Android. But, that could uh, that could definitely change, and it could move beyond the, the, the storefronts into something much more open. Sure, you, you bring up a couple of points that I wanted to to sort of get 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 to. Um, one around you know what is distribution going to look like, and particularly in the web world. I want to talk a little bit about merchandising too, and um, you know so what's the difference too? I'll, I'll start off with this one between marketing and distribution. And we're just doing a study right now and asking developers, you know, what do you do to market your app? App stores, word of mouth. You know, how far is that really going to get? But um, so, um, Sheffield, you haven't sort of sure, started yeah. back at you. What do you think about sort of yeah, marketing and merchandising or well, marketing and distribution? That's what we're totally focused on. So, if you want to say, how do I uh, monetize an app that's already popular? There's a lot of solutions for that. But what we're totally focused on is when app developers come to us and say, how do we get more exposure? Um, we can help out in terms of uh, getting more people to try your app, call, you know, you call that installs. Um, but we really want to focus that on keeping that aligned to what the user would naturally do anyway, instead of say, everybody knows what happened to Tabjoy when you know, there was a lot of uh, false downloads, I think that creates a, you know, it, it creates something that's false in the, in the rankings of the store, and so that hurts everybody. But what we're trying to do is really keep everything aligned and so help people discover apps that they would have normally found anyway, but do it in a much more cost-effective Can you give us an idea of some unique campaign that you've run that? 
Yeah, we've done um, we've done unique campaigns for uh, a large game company, Storm Eight. We've done them for what did uh, it look like? What, Group, what was Groupon. Um, well, typically, what we'll do is right now we're we're starting off in the in the very early stages. We were you know, just founded uh, earlier this year, but we have new things coming out where we used to uh, just focus on showing an app that somebody could. Uh, get rewards for for engaging, trying, re-engaging, and now what we're moving towards is um, deals. So we've started off with um, Aperdeen deals, which is really taking off really quickly now, and that's where we're um, offering discounts to certain users for engaging or trying an app, and the discounts on the app, which are instant, is for iOS and for Android, and um, it's working out really well. Now, Claudia, I mean, you've got a You've got a pretty small market, really. It's a you know it's a smaller marketplace than a lot of the other ones. But you know as it grows, or even now as it does, um, what do you have in place for developers to help market themselves, get higher up on the charts? Uh, yeah, I mean we have high levels of engagement with our apps through our various channels. So one of the unique things we do is we we like to bring users into our stores because we have so many stores and we're able to do that. Um, one of the unique merchandising campaigns we just recently did with Angry Birds. I mean, uh, every store has Angry Birds. We had to have Angry Birds. I mean, even our users love Angry Birds. I think mostly love Angry Birds. <laughs> Who doesn't? Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. So um, but what we wanted to do was to, to be kind of different and unique in terms of how we marketed the application. So we, we struck a deal with Rovio where we enabled users to bring their new color into a store. You may not know that when you walk into one of our stores with no color, because the stores are all Wi-Fi enabled, we detect the store the devices in the store, and we offer special promotions onto the device. So you can do read in store. Um, it's one of the things we've been doing. It's called More in Stores, the actual kind of the program, and it applies to books, magazines, and now apps. And so what we did was we invited users to bring in their no color with Angry Birds um, and unlock any level of the game where they were sort of stuck because they were playing the game so much using the Mighty Eagle, which is normally a dollar charge, um, free of charge in our store. So as long as they stayed in our store and played the game, they could use the Mighty Eagle. Um, and we were, in fact, one of the first physical magic places for um, Angry Birds um, for Rovio um, in June. Um, and we just recently did that with Cowboys and Aliens with the launch of the movie. Um, we have the, the comic book app um, on our store. You're having way too much fun now. I know. <laughs> <laughs> my, my boss says I have too much fun in my job. <laughs> um, but anyway, so um, users could bring their, um, their comic book in the store and they could get a secret decoder uh, app um, when they walked in the store by just bringing in their new color. So, and it's all done digitally, but what it does is it connects that digital world with the physical world and enables us to actually touch the customer in a way that normally most people can't because the app experience is really truly digital. I mean, we're all trying to kind of get an insight into what people are doing with their device. Um, and it's really hard to do um, in the mobile world. And for us, it's also hard to do, but we're able to engage the customer. We have 45,000 booksellers around the country, so we can get them to talk to our customers about apps, what apps are using, upselling. So we're utilizing all those in-store merchandising techniques to give um, developers more visibility. Charles, um, back to some of the, um, the various iterations of Android stores. Um, what are you seeing that's working well, or, or are you sort of even implementing some changes for better recognition, better searchability? Um, sure, no, those are good questions. Um, and I guess know, even in any independent ones that you've seen have done it really well. Sure. I, you know, I, I guess I'll make comments on two fronts. I was just thinking about what Claudia was talking about, and then I'm happy to address. Are you having fun in your job too? Yeah, I am. Good. <laughs> and, uh, I'll, I'll address some of the things that Google's contemplating in terms of addressing uh, searchability. But um, you know, I, I think setting up a, an app store and, and selling apps is. Um, not all that different from any type of other type of merchandising. Like if you walk into a shopping mall, there are hundreds and hundreds of different types of stores which cater to very specific types of physical goods and you know naturally attract specific types of um, foot traffic. And so I think in the app world, you see similar um, dynamics where if you think of apps as SKUs, I think the you know the developers and publishers of apps they all define success in terms of a distribution along with different metrics because they're all going to be and products. And um, some, of them, uh, some of them address very narrow kind of audience or customer segments and some of them are broader. You know, two of the examples that I think Sheffield brought up uh, that he's worked with are Groupon and Storm8. I think Groupon 
you know, as it, if, if it's if the app, if the Groupon app is its product, you know, it is a product that they're trying to get as much scale and distribution as possible. So they will go spend their marketing budget in a wide variety of uh, stores or venues, like uh, with you know, app and game, where they'll advertise with any number of global ad members, where they'll try to cut deals and get uh, traffic to any number of very popular mobile apps. So you know, it's uh, not unlike a company like P&G, which sells soap in Walmart, in Target, in you know, Safeway, in a large number of stores. But um, I think a lot of the app markets that we will see built over the next few years, particularly the more successful ones, will be like specialty retailers. They will be specialty app retailers that um, you know, have an actual customer base. So I think, you know, Barnes & Noble as a, book, as a book retailer has a very defined or much more narrowly defined customer base that it has customer relationships with than, than a, kind of a broad-based um, app store like Android Market or iOS. So it's almost the difference between, you know, one a specialty mall store versus kind of like a department store or, or a general merchandising store, a big box retailer. Um, so I think, you know, if I, were to, if I were to make a bet about which app stores will do well, I think they're the ones that will cater to niches. The same way that Lululemon seems to be doing a great job these days selling, you know, women's sportswear. I'm sure there'll be an, an app store that caters to a very selective female audience, kind of 20 to 50, and, and will own that market. Um, the next couple of years, I'm sure the same way that GameStop is the world's premier, you know, physical retailer of entertainment software and video games, they'll probably be an app store that's heavily tailored towards games and, and merchandising games to to the right audience. Um, and so, so that's kind of my first thought uh, regarding Google and, and what it's working on with, um, you know, more discoverability. Obviously, we made some really big initiatives in social the last uh, couple of months. Google Plus is. It, it, a lot of attention. Um, Google Plus is something uh, that we are looking to integrate uh, across the kind of product portfolio of Google products, particularly on mobile. So I would expect, um, although I, I can't say too much, I would expect to see more social integrations, both in the mobile advertising experience and in the way the app stores function. And so um, naturally, if the social product of Google Plus is successful in getting more um, more users and, and, and engagement, then we'll be able to cultivate a certain set of, of social data to make better recommendations or to surface um, what people within your relevant social circle or network or graph uh, are using. What's the first time you've had? Just add one thing to that is uh, I, I definitely agree that you're going to see more niche and specialization in storefronts because ultimately retailing is about moving your consumers. I think one of the differences between a mall and, and small retailer versus app stores is that the level of, of privacy and concern that people have about their devices is very different than my willingness to walk into a, a small retail shop on, uh, in a mall. And one of, the, um, one of the reasons that Apple has been very successful is they've made it very clear with a lot of their policy decisions that they consider the, the consumer's rights to be the, at the forefront. So whether it's removing UDID because of privacy concerns or what uh, they've made announcements about location and whether it can be used or brokered, I think that users are uh, comfortable that whatever they download from Apple is not going to infect their phone, it's not going to have an adverse impact. And that's going to be a challenge for Android because it is so widely dispersed. The um, security uh, kind of uh, exploits have been on the rise in Android. And so there is going to be the importance of a trusted brand, someone who says, I, I'm distributing these apps, but this, this is safe, this is a safe place to do that. And it will be interesting to see how, you know, whether, whether Google actually offers some sort of a code scanning service or, or something that backs up the Android marketplace, or whether some of these niche marketplaces are gonna say, yeah, I have Android, but I've curated something which I know is safe. So Vodafone just launched an Android store, and they say they're gonna win at it because They've got carrier carrier billing that's going to make all the difference in the world. Um, comments: um, Do you think the in-app, the, the carrier billing, is really going to make a difference, and can carriers actually run app stores? Any operators? I should probably comment on that since okay. operators yeah, are yeah. amongst our biggest customer base. Uh, so I think uh, carrier billing is extremely important in certain markets. You go to places. Uh, like India, South America, 
you, you can't charge someone on a credit card. You, you really have to have carrier billing. So uh, absolutely, in certain markets, they are the only way that you're going to monetize a, a premium application. Um, carriers um, always want to uh, play a strong role in retailing. Um, they, they did that with the WAP decks. They're doing that again with the storefronts right now. I think for carriers, the biggest challenge is going to be that knowing their audience, having the intelligence about users, and then using that intelligence to target, it gets into a touchy space for them because they make money off of their billing plans. Uh, they make a lot of money off of that. And so they always fear any kind of their brokering with privacy in order to make more money. And that's going to be that's going to be a significant tension. So we work with a lot of carriers on launching storefronts. We're kind of the, the trusted provider of, of performing that retailing function. It provides a remove from, from their own business, and so they're, they're happy to do that. Uh, so I think that the, there are going to be some carriers that will be successful, that have a lot of reach, that make it really easy to get payments. There are a lot of carriers that are going to you know, get into it and get overwhelmed and probably continue to outsource. Shindel, any uh, any other comments around that? Uh, well, for myself, um, I mean, we don't we really don't deal with that too much in our business. Just from a personal perspective, it seems a lot easier. Um, I remember originally going through Android Market a year ago, and there was different uh, currencies, and it was just a mess trying to go through and actually purchase an app. So, I personally think it will help out a lot, but I really can't speak to it from a business perspective. Claudia, you've been around for a while. Any thoughts? Well, yeah. Meant that in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, we definitely don't deal with carriers. Our product, our you know, color is Wi-Fi only, so we don't really have a model to involve the carriers. So I don't really. But any thoughts? Them. I mean, you have been in, yes, been in the industry um, for a long time, so you know how everybody works and um, what everybody's up to. You know, I do think that there's something to be said for providing the easiest experience to customers in terms of um, the billing. Um, but I do think that everything else matters a lot too. So that you know, user experience and you know, is is the carrier really adding value when they're offering their own apps? Or if they're not, then they're not going to be successful. I mean, to the, you just said there's 160 app stores out there for Android. The users can choose the one that they feel, or the several of them that they feel is, is the best. And if if the payment is the factor that drives them in terms of convenience, they will go with the carrier one. But I don't think there's any point in trying to block everything else just to drive the, you know, the carrier store on device because I feel that that will just make users discontent and ultimately there's just too much choice out there in Android right now. People can walk and go to another phone. So. Charles, Charles? Um, I, again, I, I kind of return to the analogy of merchandising. I think <laughs> it's, it's, it will depend on how how strong the customer relationships any given carrier has with its you know, subscriber base. It's probably not unlike um, the automobile market where, you know, dealing with the carrier because it's a platform and it's a necessity, you know, customers have to pick one carrier if they want to have a cell phone. I think it's the same with a car where if you buy a car, you know, you can go to any Ford, Mercedes, whatever type of dealership you want, and you have to have to deal with that infrastructure, that company to, to buy a car. But when all of those car companies, you know, want to sell you hats or t-shirts embroidered with their logos or any other type of you know whether it's formats or other accessories you know some people have a strong affinity with the car company that they're dealing with or the, the car they buy and they're happy to buy polo shirts that have a logo whatever type of car they drive others you know they can think of nothing more repugnant than giving more money to the uh to, to, to the dealer that they're dealing with and i think it's the same with carriers you'll probably have some folks who are more than happy to spend you know a dollar on buying some sort of you know ringtone or wallpaper app, but uh, giving another dollar to AT and T or Sprint or Verizon is the last thing they want to do. They'd rather go do it elsewhere. Or so, has, Google, so. has Google? Has uh, Google? Can you confirm or deny that Google is paying carriers to not set up a fragmented Android storefront and instead double down on the Android marketplace? I have no comments on that. Mm -hmm. Let's open it up to the floor here. Anybody have any questions for the, for the folks here? I need to go ahead. Is there, a, is there a point where you think that in the Android marketplace, it will kind of like trip over its own feet because they're trying to come up with something new all the time, all the time, and it's like gonna basically just kind of caramelize itself? It sounds to me that with all like the 160 app stores and everybody's kind of getting you know, separated, that it's just going to fragment the market a little bit. Um, you know, 
I can't comment directly on behalf of my colleagues who work for the Android Marketplace product, but what I would say about Google and kind of mobile in general is, you know, we have a lot of different products. We all serve a huge, an entire ecosystem of constituents, right? So I happen to sit in the mobile ads business, but you know, I think if I take a step back and just think Google Mobile, we work with, you know, third party software developers, app developers, we work with carriers, we work with handset manufacturers, we work with all sorts of different constituents. And, um, you know, obviously not everyone's interests are aligned and, and uh, we have to try to strike some sort of balance in, in, in creating an ecosystem. Um, it's, with respect to your question, yes, I mean, there are a lot of problems that have been well documented or uh, issues that have come up in the last kind of year and a half, 18 months. Uh, and, you know, again, well documented tech crunch all the industry blogs uh, of Android and Google, different Google mobile businesses stepping on their toes and that's just going to continue to be a challenge. Right? All we can do is hope that uh, the ecosystem continues to be robust, that you know, handset manufacturers want to build devices for it and put Android on it, that um, developers want to continue to build apps, and that you know, carriers want to sell those phones. Um, there will always be conflicts of interest in it, and there it's will the be good, mistakes. The good and bad of the industry, yeah. right? Like it's, it's a dynamic industry, which is fantastic. It's growing, you know? All of us are going to be in the industry for a long time. There's an industry that's going to be around, but at the same time, it's still early days, so there's just lots of testing that's still being done, and I think that's the headings that we have to deal with. And, and I mean, the reason why I ask is because like, I did games for all the, all the platforms, and like, you know, the Windows Phone 17, so I got, you know, the Android, I got the iPhone, and it's just, you know, like a year ago, two years ago, it was like all I had. You know, so we were like one of the first people to put games on the, on the store. And then, you know, Android comes along, and then Windows Phone 7 comes along, and I'm wondering, you know, because it's always a question before you, so you make a game, it's like, do I want to make it for this platform? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. that's kind of the, the, the blessing curse of having choices to develop, right? That's, that's, a, that's a business decision and a kind of a resource allocation issue for you and your company. Mm -hmm. Question behind? Um, so I was curious, and I want to open this up to the panel, is that or are you guys interested in getting more long tail developers uh, using your stores and sort of putting stuff on your stores? And what are some of the things we can do to I can answer from Barnes and Noble. We're, you know, we, we're definitely interested in growing our catalog and uh, we're investing in that right now. I mean, we, we have uh, you know, about 500 apps right now in the store. We're not a huge store, um, but that's part of the secret to our success is that we are very curated. Um, but we think there's lots of room to grow and lots of potential. Our customers, apps are the number one really request from the color customers. When we launched the product, everybody waited for apps. And once we launched our update for applications, um, our customers just kept asking for more um, because they buy the product as a reader's tablet and they buy content. And then they realize how much more they can do with it. And it's $249. It's a great price tablet. So um, they want to just keep buying content and apps. You know, they really see the functionality as the reason why they purchase the device. So we can, you know, keep on bringing in more apps, and I think they'll continue to be extremely successful. Plus, we're filling in a lot of new categories that we haven't really filled in from launch. So, yeah, absolutely, very interested. Yeah, I mean, pretty much everybody is looking for the long tail. Yeah. It's they're just but they're like really what good stuff. You know, or do you have an API that they'll plug into, or is it still a long like um, maybe process to get? No. Pre-installed, um, and then just just what are, what are some details, and how do you then sort of uh, you know get people enticed to come onto yours as opposed to some other um, Again, for us, we uh, so we we have an SDK. It's an add-on to the standard Android SDK. Mm -hmm. um, we have some APIs that are, that are unique to us as well. Um, it's not hard. Uh, it's actually really easy. It takes anywhere from days to week, week a few weeks. You know, depends on the app and, and the technology. Um, and we, you know, we, we would engage with anybody who approaches us. And we have a qualification process. Um, and the kinds of apps we're looking for, I mean, uh, the categories that are growing for us are categories that are somewhat, again, unique. Um, children's apps, uh, lots of casual games. Um, so word games, brain teasers, puzzles, there's tons of room for that. Um, although we have many every week that come in. Um, Lifestyle apps, so a lot of content apps, brand name apps um, in the lifestyle category, like fitness, uh, health, fashion, cooking. Um, you know, so they're you know think of our demographic. You can probably figure out you know what what they're looking for, but lots of utilities too, because again, our users are just trying to utilize their product as a, a device as a tablet. 
Um, so I can talk to you more offline if you want to know specifics, but we have actually a whole page on our development program website all about the categories we're targeting and what kinds of apps we're looking for. You know, we got started uh, working with developer programs only six years ago now. We could probably count 20, you know, that you could actually work with. And, um, now we're counting into the hundreds or more because everybody wants the long tail and everybody's open up APIs. And I mean, every day there is a new developer program event that you can go to. So there, if, if you're a developer, <laughs> um, it's, it is really hard actually to pick and choose what you, know, what you want to do and it's going to make sense for, for whatever your business is. Jay, you were next. Uh, yeah. And then you were next. And then you're next. Oh, cool. Okay. So I had a bunch of questions and I'll just condense into <laughs> one. Which is, so, on this whole analogy of the merchandised, verticalized app stores that are coming. And we're already seeing some fragmentation in Android in particular. And my portfolio companies call me and their basic issue is, you know, I don't know which ones to put my money behind. I don't know which ones to put my effort around. I don't know where to think about how to, if I'm gonna invest any discoverability dollars or if I'm gonna sort of put any marketing move and business development relationships try to get featured in the Android store or the, or the, or the uh, Amazon store, just as one example, but all these other. I guess my question is, what best practices or advice do you give the developers around, here's how to think through merchandising your app today, and here's how to think about where you're going to want to, how you're going to want to merchandise in the future. How do, you, how do you get critical mass when you have a panoply of stores? And, you know. It gets back to what I was saying earlier about distribution and monetization. So wherever you decide to go, uh, from a dis distribution perspective, are there levers for the developer to actually manage distribution? So in iOS, uh, Tapjoy was really effective for a while. The developers were saying the only way I can spend money reliably in order to get performance is Tapjoy, um, and so a lot of developers were very unhappy when when Apple changed its regulations. But essentially, the Tapjoy vision was line up a chunk of $50,000 and spend it as fast as possible. I'm going to get you to the top of the chart and then you're going to get a four to one download rate just organically by being at the top of the chart. There's still a lot of, uh, uh, how do I get to the top of the chart in order to get the organic downloads is, is part of the model. But that matters if you are, if you need traffic scale. So are you making money off of impressions and so therefore you really need a lot of installs or do you have a strategy for in-app purchases where you can migrate from free into a paying customer? Uh, if you're more of a, a niche app, then you can always, there's ways you can market on the web and then click through the Android store and click through the iOS. There's a lot of people who don't necessarily require that kind of scale in order to make money. Um, today, the fact is that the app stores are dominated by gaming. I mean, no matter how you slice the data, the, the, the biggest volumes of, of downloads, the biggest volumes of monetization are all happening through gaming. And there's a lot of interesting niche models where People, uh, the app is an extension of an existing web service, so it, it's more of a play for having uh, user loyalty. So I use I use the service on the web, like you know, I just traveled and I got the Expedia app, and it was great. I was able to actually get through passport customs by showing a picture on my uh, my phone saying, "Hey, you know, I'm on this flight." And so th that's a very different strategy. So they push you to download the app at the end of the checkout in Expedia. They say, "By the way, track your flight. Go here." So it's it's. Um, it's a complicated question because you really need to know what, what is the ultimate end goal of the business in getting into mobile. And there are, uh, from from distribution lever standpoint, you can buy through the ad networks, but that isn't as effective as TapJoy used to be. So can you get featured uh, in a storefront? And there's a lot of storefronts that will do special featured deals, which is, with the fragmentation, maybe you'll find a niche Android storefront that says, I'll push your app in order to, to put you at the top of the charts. But uh, it, it's really sensitive to whatever the goal of that business is as far as mobile distribution. Who the target customer is. You know, I mean, again, we, we know our customers and we know what, what they buy, right? And so we're able to do lots of recommendations and cross merchandising. So it actually is pretty easy for us when we get out. So the affinity between great. us. Yeah. And I, I would just say, I think, well, though, I think it's interesting no that, because it's, it's uh, and maybe there is a resource where it's just like, okay, I have. Uh, like like one of my portfolio companies is Foodspy, which would be right in your demographic, yeah. right? But it's like I don't know the resource <laughs> to go to tell the founders like, okay, here's kind of the stack rank of yeah. kind of for you know of Android stores that sort of do the most in terms of the demographic of 
you know, 65% women between this age that do this stuff. Yeah. Like, I just don't know. I'm sure a lot of that's even published. No. Yeah. Right. I don't think there is a sort of aggregated view of, like, here's Business the, opportunity. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. It's a very good point. Right. Yeah, we have Check a couple back more room, questions. <laughs> a couple more questions before we wrap for lunch. Jason? Oh, no, no, I, I'm good. Someone else answered it. Okay, perfect. Yeah, tell us that. This is a question for Claudia. First of all, thank you guys all for being here. It's great. Um, it seems like it's it's likely that the Kindle price point is going to move to zero. And uh, one thing that I didn't realize before was that it sounds like your positioning the Nook is kind of a, a mix of the Kindle and the iPad in ways where it's a reader, but it also runs apps. I just would love to hear a little more about your strategy on where you plan on really focusing the Nook in terms of a free Kindle and a very popular iPad. So so it, so it, we are right now the only uh, full color, full touch reader on the market, reader's tablet. That's why we call it reader's tablet, because it's, we also have a product, the Nook Simple Touch, which we launched in June, which is more akin to the Kindle, so it's more of a competitor, um, which is priced at $139. Um, and it's actually a fantastic product. And it's also touch, by the way, so it's a very unique product with uh, lots of advancements in terms of uh, e-ink e readers. Um, you know, I, I, I'm i not going to be able to comment as to a roadmap or a future direction. I can tell you with the reader's tablet, with the Nook Color, we are right now in a fantastic, unique position. We are priced as one of the most affordable tablets on the market. Um, we love our customers to say that they purchase it as a reader and they discover that it's more than a reader and that they're doing everything like a tablet. Um, we think it, we're giving them amazing value, you know, at the price because they can do so much more than just read. Um, you know, so I can't really compare it to a subsidized Kindle. Um, it's just a completely different uh, device and uh, our customers are getting tremendous value from it um, at its current price point. Um, so, and you know, what the future will hold, I can't really speak to at this point, but, um, you know, we are, we are all about reading, I can say that, and uh, we continue to evolve, you know, based on that. So we need to wrap. I just wanted to add, just one quick add on, uh, obviously Barnes & Noble doesn't want to go the way of Borders, and I, I just wonder how much mind share is they're getting in, inside management at Barnes & Noble? Is this like the future of the company? It is the future. We're investing heavily in digital. Um, and uh, you know, you may have heard about the uh, investment from Liberty Media last week. Um, the reason they stated publicly they made the investment is because they believe in our digital strategy. Um, we're heavily evolving our entire physical business to digital, um, and you're going to see that in terms of transformation of our retail stores and how much more we're focused on Nook, um, which is our digital brand for reading. So um, the future is 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 there for us, and we, I mean, the company overall is really well best invested in it. So our, you know, if you read this, it actually said the core question is, what is the future of distribution? And I'm not sure if we've answered anything, but I think we definitely <laughs> talked about uh, uh, niche stores. Um, talked a lot about, too, which has come out, is that need for, need for information about really who, who is the customer of that store or the operator. And I, that is something I think that's wide open for carriers to really get a better handle on and, and also the stores for being uh, more open about. And we didn't really talk much, hit much on, on web yet, but that's probably coming too. But so I'm just gonna run through you guys and go, uh, the core question, what's the future distribution? It's complicated. It's complicated. <laughs> complicated. Yeah. It's not a movie. Does anyone have a crystal ball? The future of distribution is now. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I think Jay asked a great question that, uh, and, and it's you know it's it's hard to uh, not really give a, a great answer, but it, it, it is about um, understanding an audience. I think the anyone who has a storefront is facing a lot of pressure right now to provide more um, intelligence around who the users are, the other yeah. that storefront, and it's going to trickle through from there. So analytics is uh, is absolutely key. Specialization is going to be key. And, and again, providing the monetization story because um, developers can't just keep making things for free. Yeah. Claudia? Well, I think it's really thinking about what the customer wants. You know, I think that we, we you know, I come from a technology world and now I live in a world where it's really kind of a physical, you know, retail world evolving to, to digital. And 
I'm learning how much I was sort of immersed in technology that we sort of get jaded by it and we forget to think about the customer. And my, like my customer is not technical. You know, they, they ask me what's what you know what do you mean swipe on the screen? What does that actually mean? You know, that kind of brought it home for me. That I learned that in week one on the job. It was like people don't know what swipe means. Well, you know, well, but but people are reading physical books and they're buying Nook. You know, sixty five year old comes in and buys a Nook. It means to steal, right? Swipe it. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> so to steal it. You know, it's, so I think think about the customer. That's the future of distribution. Is thinking about how you meet the needs of the customer. Um, and for me, that's the reality of what we're doing right now. Or, no. Sheffield? Yeah, so yeah, I think it's all based on whoever can make it the simplest and most transparent, feel good way for a cut consumer to spend money on an app. I deal with developers all the time that at least a few months ago, they were telling me that their value of an Android user was one tenth to one twentieth that of an iOS user, just based on the revenue that would come into them. So I think that's starting to change now that it's easier to buy apps and do in-app purchases. But I think that's what it's all about, because when you make it easier for a consumer to trust <coughs> something and spend money in a certain channel, the developers are going to follow, and everything will just grow. Yeah. 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 Yeah.